what is our aim? I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. But without victory there is no survival. Seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change power and success in the world. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. Hello and welcome to No Limitations, a show where we talk to people who have had outstanding success in their careers and finding out why, discovering the influences that shaped their destinies. I'm your host, Greg Robinson from Blenheim Partners, Executive Search and Board Advisory. On the show today, we are discussing one of the most talked about, but perhaps misunderstood topics, the impact of artificial intelligence on Australian business and the future of work. Every parent is struggling to give advice to their children on what to study and which career to pursue, as every blue collar and white collar worker is trying to figure out, will their role be here in five years or less? All politicians have yet to come to grips with the pace of change and business is worried that foreign aggressors will take market share. To help me on this very important topic, today I'm joined by Michael Prittis, an international thought leader on artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, who has moved mountains in a global diary just to be here today. Michael has presented to the four corners of the world the impact AI will have on global economies, workforce and structures, and the broader society, having addressed both corporate and government leaders with engagements in New Delhi, Cape Town, Paris, Toronto, San Francisco, Singapore and Sydney within the last two years. Michael was the founder and CEO of Australia's 19th fastest growing company until its acquisition by Boston Consulting Group. He then became the Managing Director for Asia for BCG's technology innovation practice, which became Digital Ventures, and has more recently established Fathom, an R&D company with its groundbreaking technology to help governments and organisations calculate and predict the economic impact of the technological and digital disruption. He is one of five external members of BHP's Science and Innovation Council and has been asked to participate at the World Economic Forum's Summer Davos, the event in September. So quite frankly, we are lucky to have you here. Michael, welcome. Good afternoon, how are you? Fantastic. Michael, as a nation, are we prepared for this new wave of AI? No, absolutely not. However, to soften that message slightly, very few companies are. Australia, despite the fact that we are thinking about it, we're talking about it, there are notable gaps in many areas of Australian preparation. Australia does not yet have a coherent national policy on AI. There is no sub significant government funding to fund the development of AI, the commercialisation or the exploration of it. There are insufficient activity levels between industry, academia and government when they, th when they come together to think about what AI might mean. And there's no real activity yet happening to prepare the population for the skill development they're going to need to be able to utilise and deploy and get benefit from AI as AIs and robotics and other technologies that are similar become available. So from your experience, of which businesses or sectors are well prepared and which ones are not? So it's probably helpful here to start thinking about the types of AI that businesses are exploring or working with. Um, we have a, a distinction between process and social AI. Process AI being that AI that's applied to business processes within the organisation. Social AI is much more about the AIs that interact with customers, interact with clients. 
Now, when you're interacting with customers with a new technology, that's risky. So most organizations working with AI at the moment are working internally on process AI areas. So the organizations, the industries, the sectors that are most advanced are those that have well-defined processes internally and the capabilities in terms of their internal smarts to think about process engineering, to think about how those processes can be changed through AI, and they have the capital to apply to that. So typically we tend to look at organizations like the major banks, the major retailers, the major logistics businesses, the miners, companies that have control over internal processes where they can experiment with, deploy, and then scale those technologies. And what, what is your definition of AI? Because it's been bandied around for a long time. Mm. Is there a misunderstanding? Yeah, I think there's, um, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a quite a, an, almost an umbrella term nowadays. There's a distinction that, that um, academics or, or uh, developers would make between machine learning and deep learning. Quite often machine learning is referred to as AI, whereas it actually is more of a, it's a learning tool rather than necessarily an intelligent tool. I think the most helpful definition or distinction is um, ANI, AGI, and ASI. So just to explain that, artificial narrow intelligence, an intelligent system that does a very narrow thing very, very well. Simply chess. It would be difficult for you to beat a computer at chess. Mm -hmm. It couldn't do anything else. It doesn't have a general level of intelligence, a broader level of intelligence. It does one thing very, very well. Artificial general intelligence has um, a number of capabilities across a wide array. Artificial superintelligence is, as the word would suggest, a superintelligent sentient um, being. Now, fortunately at the moment, we don't have to wrestle with artificial general or artificial superintelligence because they don't yet exist. Artificial superintelligence may never exist. Artificial general intelligence is probably not that far away. And this is the uh, ability of an AI to have a broad set of capabilities and to replicate or to automate or to have a, a material similarity to the way that a human would think. How many years behind do you see Australia? I wouldn't say it was behind in terms of across the board. I think there are certain areas of Australian um, industry and certain areas of academia where Australia leads. Okay. So some of the work that some of the big banks are doing is remarkable on any kind of metric. Now, if you look at the quantum lab at um, University of New South Wales, it's a world leader. If you look at some of the research being done at the CSIRO, particularly in Data61, it's a world leader. So it's not that we're behind across the board. It's that other countries have got to, done a better job of coordinating and corralling all of the different initiatives to create a coherent national policy or coherent national plan. So we look at the countries like the UK, France, Canada, Germany, South Korea, Singapore, China. All of these countries have very clear, coherent, funded AI policies that are, um, span pretty much every area of industry and every area of society. And they've really thought about it and they've really funded it. We're not there yet. So your concern is around the, the, the gap, which it, well, the, the, the leap that we're going to take and the loss of people able to make that move at the pace that we need to? Yeah, I think pace is the key word there. Um, this isn't waiting for anyone to catch up. One of the issues that we have in a technology-driven, globalised world is that when other countries or other markets, other industries are, are, are racing at the same sort of speed as that, as the technology, it's easy to get left behind. And then there's a compounding problem that as other countries advance and we're still struggling to keep up, they're seeing the benefits or the fruits of that advance and we fall further and further behind. So what sort of statistics are we sort of talking about the differential between us and major OECD countries? Well, I don't have a statistic on the performance, our performance on AI, but I do have a, the, some interesting information around um, the way that Australian industry and R&D collaborate. So that's often a good way of understanding the degree of sophistication in industry is to say how much time are they spending in R&D labs, how much R&D is happening uh, in a collaborative way between industry and um, academia. Um, in an OECD survey that came out in 2015, mm -hmm. Australia was 33rd out of 33 countries. Mexico was twice as good at collaboration and commercialisation of R&D as us, and they were 32nd. If we're 33 out of 33, what needs to be said and what needs to be done, Michael? Well, I think there are certain organisations that exist in other countries that are completely absent here. Um, I think a really good and quite reasonable comparison between Australia and another country is us and Canada. Mm -hmm. So very similar countries geographically in terms of population size, the way that government interacts with industry, even down to things like the structure of the financial services industry, very, very similar. Canada's got four organisations which do not exist here in any kind of similar way. The first one is the Canadian Growth Council. This is a group of um, public servants and senior industry leaders 
who think in very bipartisan and long-term ways about what's going to drive growth and what the economic priorities of Canada should be. That then cascades down right the way through different areas of industry, but particularly lands in the lap of an organisation called the MOAT Centre. So MOAT Centre is almost like the Lowy Institute, but for domestic policy, particularly focusing on economic policy. It's then supported by the work of the Brookfield Institute, which is out of Ryerson University. Brookfield Institute is a research and, and development uh, lab really focusing on future of work, fourth industrial revolution, the impact of emerging technology. Finally, and I think most importantly, uh, Canada's got an organisation called the Mars Discovery District. So Mars is the world's biggest public-private innovation hub. It's in a building that itself is over a billion dollars worth of, of real estate. It's an entire city block in downtown Toronto. They have hundreds of companies in start-up and scale-up mode. And they provide on-site venture services, operation support. All of those organisations are technology companies. As a result of Mars, Toronto has the third biggest tech population in North America after Silicon Valley and then New York. And on the current growth rate, Toronto will be the single largest tech employment area in North America because of the growth of the Mars Discovery District. Those organisations don't exist in Australia, and I think they should. Is the issue more with government or more of the leadership in business, in the, in the, at the boardroom, at the executive level, where, where, is, where is the education needed and how quickly? Well, quickly is, again, a key word there. I don't think you could point fingers and say, it's them, it's them, it's not us, it must be them, and so on. I think, I think it's more helpful to say, well, why is it difficult in um, political circles to um, kind of come up with these policies and why is, why is industry perhaps a little bit behind? Yep. Um, Part of it is that we don't have a particularly good track record of um, kind of durable bipartisan policy um, development. Um, we, we tend to kind of spin through you know, prime ministers or spin through ministers of in, uh, industry quite quickly. I think we're on about the fifth um, minister for industry, innovation and science now in, in the last two or three years. So having some, some um, sustainable, durable you know, longevity in those seats would, would be a helpful thing. But I don't think you can say it's just the politicians. We have a unique circumstance in industry, in the economy in this country, which is that we've had 26 years of unbroken growth. And that 26 years means that if you're an executive leading a large organisation and you've got 25, 30 years' experience, you've never really experienced adversity. Mm. And because you've never experienced adversity, and because things have basically grown really as a result of system issues and system strengths, we've never, we don't have a culture in the boardroom, a culture in, the lead, in, in leadership groups of thinking about really tough problems. Now, that's not a criticise at all. It's just a function of the things that drive today's prosperity. But when we look back over the last kind of 20, 30 years, what have been the drivers of growth? Has it been individual innovation? Has it been collaboration between industry and government? No, it's been a function of having literally the world's biggest defensive moat. You know, you had across the Pacific or the Indian Ocean to come and compete here. Yeah. It's been a function of high levels of immig immigration in the 60s, 70s and 80s we tend to be young people without children who then have children. So we've just had a demographic growth, demographic demand, literally more mouths to feed. Because it's a small economy or relatively small economy, there's a small number of companies in each industry, and so we tend to have oligopolies or oligopoly-like behaviours. Four banks, you know, two or three retailers, two or three telcos. And as a result of that, low levels of competition, low levels of incentive to innovate. We then had, through the Hawke-Keating government years in the end of the 80s, compulsory superannuation and that put essentially 10 percent of national gdp into an investment bucket every year for 30 years so we've got an incredibly mature and well-off wealth management industry and an investment industry um, a lot of the development work that's happening in construction people's second homes the, the kind of the surplus in the system a lot of that comes from having a very strong wealth management um, industry and investment pool when you put all those things together and you then add to that the perhaps one in a, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 years export boom of resources into, into China. You say, well, you know, this is the lucky country. But as a result of that, if you're leading a company, you've basically just needed to kind of turn up and make sure you don't kind of stuff up yeah. for the organisation to grow. As a result of that, we don't have a huge depth of capability, naturally, or a culture of taking risks, of experimenting, of realising that if we don't do something today, it's all over tomorrow. And unfortunately, as we look at the impact of technology, we do need to act a bit faster than we have been doing in the past. So what advice would you give um, CEOs or chairs if you were to go to see them? I think two key points. Firstly, um, I think the issue is not helped by some of the terminology. 
People talk about the future of work, and that's quite easy to say, well, that's not now, right? That's the future. No, it's now. These things are not coming in five years or ten years. They'll be bigger in five or ten years, but they've begun now. So I'll tell you a bit of a story just to kind of um, explain that a bit more. So my company, Fathom, is the first company in Australia to be invited to join the World Economic Forum Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. We're the second company in Asia, the 16th company in the whole world to be invited. As a result of this, three weeks ago I was in San Francisco. I was in attending a, um, a World Economic Forum event. And first, the first thing off, uh, uh, on, on the agenda was uh, Klaus Schwab, who's the chairman of the forum, interviewing none other than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. I've got to say, I was very surprised when he walked out, just quite amazed to actually be literally 10 or 20 feet away from Arnie. But he was interviewing Arnie about his time as the governor of California and what it was like to develop policy in uh, California uh, in, a, in a way that was very kind of sympathetic to industry but also sympathetic to the environment. And Arnie started talking about climate change. And California, if you remember, was one of the first states to have really strong climate change policies. Yeah, and he was, Arnie was asked how he did that. And I think the analogy is, is, is good here. We're thinking about how do CEOs or how, do, how does government think about the long-term effects of technology. Well, Arnie was being asked to think about the long-term effects of climate change. And what he said I thought was really interesting. People are really, really bad at thinking long-term. He said, you can tell politicians, you can tell industry leaders until you're blue in the face about rising sea levels and you know the, the world their children will inherit and their grandchildren's prosperity and ice flows and polar bears' inability to jump from ice flow to ice flow. You can see all of that all day long and no one will care. The number one thing that got them over the line in terms of what they were doing was to make it real today. And they said, okay, what is the effect of pollution or carbon emissions and CFCs today? And it turns out that the pollution levels in California, the pollution levels around the world today, were killing more people than all suicides, homicides, and conflict in the US. It was killing more people than um, AIDS, malaria, and TB combined worldwide every single day. And when you look at the issue in, in those sort of terms, you're not thinking about it in some long-term effect that may or may not happen. You're thinking about the effect today. So the number one recommendation for industry leaders and for government leaders is what's happening today. Don't worry too much about tomorrow. What's happening today? Put in place actions today. Think about the effects today that you want to be seeing because you can guarantee other companies, other countries are thinking about what to do today. So the expression of the future of work, what does that actually mean to you? I think it's a again, is another really good kind of piece of um, umbrella terming there. Um, it, means, it means what is the effect of emerging technology on the way that people deliver processes, tasks and services in companies? Um, how is technology changing the workforce, changing the workplace? What type of roles, what type of skills will we need? How will people use robotics or drones or AI or any of those things in their day-to-day -day work? It's also come to imply um, a slightly, in fact, very negative a connotation of automation, well, fewer people required. Sense of fear. Out exactly. There, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, you know, if you look at the way the media um, particularly cover it, it's always jobs gone, never jobs created, never jobs materially changed, what we would call augmented, with the addition of these technologies to create new things to be more productive. It's always such and such companies cutting so many jobs, that's future of work. Michael, do you, do you feel the government or the governments of Australia have an appreciation of the pace of change? Yeah, I think they definitely appreciate it. I don't think people, anyone really fully understands it. There's every time you open the newspaper, or well, in fact, who opens the newspaper nowadays? Anytime you turn on the TV, you look in your email, you look in the newsletter, there's some piece of information that blows your mind. I mean, there's, I don't have a full appreciation of it, and I spend every day, all day, thinking about it, reading about it, talking about it. Um, I do think governments here understand that there is a major change underway. Um, I don't think they're necessarily fully informed. I don't think that's their fault. I just think that the pace is so quick. Um, it's quite recent. I mean, I've, I have, in 20 years of being at work, never seen an issue go from zero to this level of prominence in such a short period of time. We couldn't have had this conversation two or three years ago. Mm. You know, two or three years ago, if I said, you know, mass automation and industry reshaping and the effects on trade and the effects on developing countries... No one really was kind of thinking about it back then, very few people anyway. Nowadays, I think you know, the effects of technology in terms of business models and the effects of technology in terms of operations, they're the two questions the boards and executives are spending all the time thinking about. They're thinking about it, but are they, are they structuring the organisation to reflect the change? No, um, mainly because most organisations haven't yet determined what that change means for them. 
And the reason why I can be certain about that is that's the work that my company does, is we help organizations to understand what is the future impact of technology on my workforce, on my market, on my industry? How do I need to equip my organization with the right number of people in the right roles, with the right skills to adopt those technologies, to deploy them, to have an effect? That's precisely what we do. And the fact that we've just recently set up, we've just recently started this work, we're up to about 30 or so companies using our platform today in Australia, uh, more overseas. Um, but this is really, really new. And so most organizations have not yet equipped them. They haven't delivered on this. Some are starting to, but most have not. So are you surprised by the level of thinking? No, I mean, I think this is such a new issue that most people are still working out what the issue is. You know, there's an old saying that the best strategy is the right question. I think people are still trying to decide what that question is. Um, I do think there's some organizations that are definitely further ahead. Um, there are some countries that are further ahead. I, I would never criticize a company or a government for not being on top of its, uh, this issue because I think it's a complicated issue that's moving quickly. I would be critical if they weren't acting to try and get on top. What's, what skills do you see dominating coming through from executives? Is, is it more around a uh, level of curiosity playing a, a greater part? Yeah, I think curiosity is a good place to start. There's something I often say, I get asked this question quite often, um, something I often say is that um, computers are good at the jobs we find hard and bad at the jobs we find easy. So just to explain that a little bit, um, we're not really built as humans to do a repetitive task again and again and again and again and again. We're not built to operate in dangerous circumstances. We're not built to carry heavy objects. We're not built to ferry people or goods from A to B. Um, so any of these things that we're not naturally good at are things that actually computers tend to be pretty good at, calculations or working in you know, blazing buildings or carrying an object. These are things that we automate. It's very difficult, however, to get a machine or a computer, an AI or whatever it might be, robot, drone, to do the things that we're naturally good at. You mentioned curiosity, mm. care, compassion, communication, imagination, ingenuity, risk tolerance, dealing with ambiguity, being able to collaborate, being able to bring people together, being able to motivate or inspire. These are things that are naturally human. The challenge is that most work is in the first group. Most work is about lifting, carrying, processing, calculating. It's not about creating or communicating. Increasingly it is, but it, in terms of the volume of work, more work is happening in the first group than the second. What that means, therefore, is that as technology um, comes online and as we start deploying these technologies, um, there will be a, a, a huge effect in the people whose jobs exist in that first group. And for those jobs who do exist in that first group, where would you put them in, in, in regards to the world scale? In the sense of, you said early, early on, we've lacked or haven't had the exposure in the sense of adversity. Yeah. So are we nimble in our thinking or is Australians really good at just following the rest of the world? No, I think Australians are very innovative and... and um, um, very capable um, and, and there's, there'd be no distance between them and any other um, country in terms of their ability to, to be nimble or agile. One of the things that I like as an English expat now living and working here is that Australia has a natural world view. Most people have passports, most people travel, most people look overseas quite happily and quite comfortably, most people are aware of what's happening in, I don't know, politics in North America or, you know, issues in, in you know, any pick a country, most people have a point of view. Um, and that's different. I mean, most countries, I would say, probably don't have quite the same degree. So I don't think Australia is worse off in terms of culture. I think the challenge is, um, as a smaller country, as a smaller economy, it's, it's harder to have the same amount of capital in the system, let's say. It's, it's, it's harder to feel that these are global issues that we can affect. And I, think we, I do think we can. What about the culture being risk averse? I don't know if that's true. Okay. Um, I mean, in my experience, I've, I've, um, I think it comes up. Um, it comes up a lot in discussions and, yeah. and, and we're, we're notorious for being known for not taking risks, not known for not going offshore, known for holding back on M&A, known for overthinking. Maybe true. I mean, it's, it's not something I'm, I would say I was necessarily an expert in. My experience of it is that, I mean, Fathom is the fourth business that I've been involved in setting up as an Australian company that went overseas. And now my personal experience is that there is a, startup community here. There is innovation happening in the labs. There is a worldview in terms of what our, the effect of that innovation, whether it's academic or industry, could be. Um, 
I, I think there may be sort of systemic issues in terms of getting that out the door, but I think in terms of attitude, it's here in spades. And based on your experience in, in presenting to boards and presenting to executives, who takes the lead on driving this, this new culture around review of the business or understanding the risk, understanding the, the opportunity and also understanding the threats in regards to AI or what you call the future of, of work? Mm. So I think there's, there's a difference between the person who's tasked with doing it who tends to be an executive responsible for transformation that could be the COO, CTO, CFO, tends to be somebody who thinks about the operating model, the business model in quite long-term ways, two, three, four, five, maybe even six years. Um, that person's quite often tasked with doing it. Sometimes they ask for it. But I think the person who initiates it could be a visionary CEO, it could be a board, it could be somebody in the organisation who's thinking about the sustainability of the organisation, it could be somebody who's thinking about what are we going to do with our people, who has a, a natural level of care for the, the people in, in the organisation, who wants to, to see them employed and see them advanced and trained as opposed to automated and made redundant. So I think there's um, the, the char- it's more about the character of the person. Do they look to the future? Do they think about not just what's in it for them in terms of is this going to affect my bonus this year because it probably isn't. It's probably a longer-term outcome. But somebody who's got a natural level of vision and a natural character to say, we should be doing something about this. And, the, and if that fear around being made redundant, where do you see the social impact? Uh, that's, that's something which is obviously coming front mm. and centre of everyone's mind. So I'm actually quite optimistic about the overall effect in the medium term of this period. I think that generally Western countries will prosper as a result of what's known as the fourth industrial revolution. I think there is a huge transition underway. Uh, I don't see the need for universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have millions of people on the street with nothing to do. Um, I do think there will be opportunities and I think new industries will rise, new jobs will be created and and I can explain why. There There are reasons why I think that will happen here. I do, however, think that there will be some communities that are adversely affected in the short term. Mm. So, for example, Launceston and Adelaide have a density of call centres. Call centres tend to operate most countries in regional towns and and communities. Call centres are likely to be automated and likely for that to happen in the next three, four, five years. I don't Mm. think, probably, that most of the people in those call centres or the people supplying goods and services to those people know that this change is coming in the short term and I think it will have an outsized effect in that community where there's a density of a particular occupation that's automated out. So I think there will be issues along the way. I don't think this transition is going to be painless by any any means and I think that's where it's beholden on government and industry to get clear on what those effects are and make sure that we're providing for those people in terms of new skill development, new opportunities for work and a social support for those people that fall through that gap. You mentioned the pace a bit earlier, Michael. Is there a chance that we're actually going to be caught between thinking through AI coming and actually turning up and that person suddenly having a job and suddenly being made redundant? That's the entire point of the work we're doing is to get ahead of that curve, to help government leaders and corporate leaders understand what the effect of those technologies will be before they come into effect in order that they can have better corporate plans. How do we transition our workforce? How do we have better learning and development? How do we have better investment in the right part of the business? How do we move people rather than making them redundant when they're trying to hire other people? How do we move people? Interesting story. Accountants are likely to feel the brunt of automation. There will probably be many fewer accountants in the back offices of Australia's companies in 10 years' time. On the other hand, technology teams are going to be crying out for information analysts, people who have skills to understand, let's say, I don't know, cryptocurrency or cyber analysis. The skills of being an accountant, the knowledge of being an accountant is completely transferable to those skills. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is people say, okay, we can cut costs here, we can automate that work out, i.e. those people are going to be going. And on the other hand, saying, well, where are we going to find all our new information analysts? Well, they're in the business right now. They're just called accountants. So how about some learning and development that helps those people with those amazing skills? Qualified, intelligent, educated, thoughtful people who are in the company right now who need a bit of L&D and see them in roles that we're going to be short of people for in the future. It's crazy that it's not happening more. Where, where does education have their role to play? 
It's the kind of key response, I think. So I think there's two main responses. The first one is investment in education, and the second is investment in infrastructure to foster new industry. But to come back to your point around, around education, you don't have to have a huge level of depth of familiarity with the issue or data to see if this change is real, and obviously we think it is, we're going to see a huge impact on the work that people do. And that work and that impact is going to touch pretty much everybody. And what's the timeline we're talking about? From now for the next 10, 15, 20 years and, and potentially beyond it. So if we're seeing almost every adult affected by this, then and we know that almost every adult will need skill development to be fully employable and productive in the future, that would mean that almost every adult would need to have access to some form of further education, some form of adult education. There is a huge gap between the ability of the education establishment in this country, and actually in every country, to deliver on the demand for adult education we're going to see in the future, and, and, and from right now. There is no infrastructure, funding, course content, teachers, locations in this country that will deal with the demand of adult education that has begun already. So it's a huge area that requires more investment. It's a huge growth industry. It's absolutely essential way of responding to the changes that we're seeing in, in industry. Am I going to want to um, encourage young kids to go to university going forward? Yeah, I think university is important. It won't stop being important. I think what's important is that the type of teaching, the type of courses, the type of content modify. I think there's huge value in learning the classics, you know, learning about foreign languages and learning history and learning English. It's not just about the, the, the content. It's about learning to learn, learning to love to learn. And leaving university with a learning mentality is one of the goals, one of the things that universities do. I think, it, though, it needs to be complemented with skills-based, applicable, action-based learning. One of my old bosses, a um, really amazing guy called Stu Dredge, used to say to me um, that the half-life of training is 30 minutes unless you apply it. You've forgotten half of what you learned as you leave the room. Most people train in order to pass an exam rather than to apply it. So we don't need to send the whole population back to do a three-year degree. We need to make three-day courses, three-week courses available to people in very specific applicable skills that they can then apply and learn as they're doing and then evolve. We don't need to take everybody out and push them through university. We need to make learning and development available and accessible in a very applied way. I'm interested in your discussions with boards and uh, CEOs. So search consultants were obviously brought in to help companies grow. When they're talking to you, are they focusing on growth or are they focusing on with AI taking cost out? Right now, I think it's mostly taking cost out. I think there's, there's very uh, real opportunities in most organisations to simplify, take cost out, achieve better margins. We all win um, in the short term. Right, and it's, it's a controllable project because it's internal. We don't have to get customers to do anything. We haven't got to get competitors to kind of behave in a certain way. We don't have to look at new markets, and it's an easy thing to do. So I think the priority in terms of activity is cost out. I think the priority in terms of the, the medium to longer term is very much around how do we grow? What does it mean in different markets? What does it mean in different industries? And there are a small number of people who are starting to think about, well, okay, what does that mean in our neighbours? What does that mean in our region? What does that mean in other countries? What are the opportunities but also what are the risks that we need to be more aware of about the effects that we're seeing in, in economies other than Australia? You mentioned your confidence around Australia, but you haven't discussed Asia. Well, I think... I'm confident about Australia because I'm, I'm optimistic that most Western countries will emerge, as I mentioned before, more prosperous, more productive. Um, I think the transition will be difficult, but I don't think it will be traumatic. The reason why Western countries will emerge well is that we have certain conditions that when compared to developing countries, they don't have. So we have capital in the system that we can invest in education, in learning and development in new industries. We have a generally cooperative relationship between industry and government. And there may be a bit of pushing and shoving, but when it comes down to it, everybody wants the same positive outcome. We have a, the means in terms of social fabric, so education, culture, um, the provision of social services, the care for those who are afflicted, the care for those who fall through the gap. We, we, we do think about and worry about people who are affected in different communities. So we have a platform. We have a platform. 
those conditions don't exist in, de- in every developing country. And they have adversity. They have adversity, but they don't have an awful lot else. So when we think about the work that is being done in many of those developing countries, it's quite often work that is either very kind of subsistence orientated or it's work that we've offshored to them. And tip, generally speaking, the West is onshoring work that we've offshored over the last 20, 30 years. So if you think about business process outsourcing, whether that's in India or in Manila, think about auto assembly in Thailand, think about clothing manufacturing right the way through Asia. 83% of Bangladeshi export GDP is ready-made garments, clothes, shirts, T-shirts, jeans, and until recently has taken fingers to put collar stiffeners in or belt loops on. But that stuff is being automated. There's no reason why a Western clothing company wants to make anything in Bangladesh other than cost. You get something made in Bangladesh, you're buying yourself maybe a cheap item of clothing, but you also buy a brand problem when it says made in Bangladesh on the label. A further brand problem when a factory burns down, people are killed. A global supply chain problem, a quality assurance problem. No one wants to make anything in Bangladesh, but because it's so cheap, they get it made there. And then they've got all this stock, which at the end of the season, they either have to literally trash or push through a discount store. More brand problems. When it becomes possible, and it has become impossible, to automate clothing manufacturing onshore, that industry in Bangladesh will have a significant reduction. And this is a country where there's already 160 million people, Mm. already hardly the richest country on earth, hardly the country synonymous with national education or national social services. What do we think is going to happen to emigration from Bangladesh when industries that are kind of the the basis of the economy are um, significantly adversely affected by technological change? Look at you know the call centers in Manila. You know, twenty, twenty-five, thirty dollars a day on average salaries. Look at the war on drugs that Duterte is pushing at the moment in, in the Philippines. Yeah. You know, what do we think is going to happen in some of those industries in some of those countries that are immediately on our on our doorstep? And I, I have a, um, as I say, a level of optimism about Western countries, but I have a level of um, a high level of concern about developing nations. So you think they've done their dash? I think the ripple effects on technology's impact on those industries are only just beginning to be understood or even discussed. Political stability, conflict, you know, major security issues. That may sound like I'm, I'm exaggerating or, or hyping this up. Um, there is a major not-for-profit based in New York that contacted us recently mm-hmm. about developing an index to look at conflict scenarios and political upheaval scenarios as as a result of technological impact in industry. I was in India working for the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs, or a project for them, and one of the people I met was talking about what they do in one of the major Indian cities when, quote, business processing outsourcing isn't here anymore. Look at Cognizant, one of the biggest BPO companies in the world. 83% of its revenue comes from the USA. They had three profit warnings in the last 12 months and now they're looking for a new CEO. The CEO of Infosys said last year, we will not be here in 10 years' time if we're relying on labour arbitrage as, the, as our business model. So if we put the thinking cap on, you're actually positioning Australia to take this as an opportunity as opposed to a threat. I think it's a huge opportunity. I mean, I think it's an why opportunity. Why are we hearing enough about this? Well, I'm only hearing the negative. Because fear gets you into the room. Right? When, when fear sells headlines, these, these stories about jobs going... This is a fantastic conference speech. Everyone's going to come along to hear that guy talk about the jobs that won't be here tomorrow. It's all about self-interest, isn't it? Right. But people buy hope. People don't buy buy fear. And um, most of the research being done on this, whether Oxford University or you know, PwC or the World Economic Forum or any of these kind of big organisations that have published on this, most of the, the forecasts and predictions have been about millions or hundreds of millions of jobs gone very little of it has been about jobs that have been created, jobs that have been augmented. And so the general tone is one of negativity, whereas I'm actually quite optimistic about it. I do think there will be jobs gone. I do think there will be jobs created, and I think there will be a whole bunch of jobs in the middle that are advanced. We, we call it automation, augmentation, and addition. The trick is being able to understand what is the new job that we can put somebody into who's coming out of a job that's, that's been automated. I can give you an example of where I think this is being done really well. So to go back to the example I mentioned before about Canada, so the Mars Discovery District um, pitched Google Org, which is the philanthropic arm of Google, to create something called the Employee Pathway Platform. 
And Mars uh, was funded by Google to do that. And Mars has bought our platform, Fathom, to, to deliver that work. And this is a not-for-profit. It's a public service so that when people in Canada are automated out of jobs, they're able to enter the employee pathway platform and be given new skills for jobs for the future. Now, these people are typically people who are low skill, low salary, who would not otherwise have the means to go about skill development. It's not pitched at the architects who get made redundant. It's going to be pitched at people who work in, in retail, people who work in construction, people who work in jobs that, as I said, they wouldn't normally access learning and development. And it's something that has been piloted in Toronto, but will be scaled across Canada. Well, that's, that's a, a great example of how a country um, with an institution like Mars is going about trying to equip its, its general population for skill development. And is that discussion happening in our powers to be? Not yet. What's going to make it happen? Conversations like this. People like you asking people like me these sorts of questions. This sort of information being put in front of influential decision makers in industry and in government who say, you know what, we should be doing that too. Michael, it's been a fascinating discussion and I'm walking away with a great deal more insight. Thank you for sharing to our many listeners what global advisors and experts like you are seeing and thinking. You've been listening to No Limitations. What is our aim? I can answer in one word. Victory. Victory at all costs. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. But without victory there is no...